Excellent. Thank you very much, Jeremy. This is going to be a fun presentation. I hope you, you get a lot out of it. I hope we're going to all laugh a little bit at some of the interesting things that we see. But this is about the who, the what, the when, the where, and the why of home inspections. So let's start with the who. Uh, who are we? We are Inspections by Bob. We started in 2003. Uh, we're both ASHI members, and you know what? If you want to read about us, you can go to our website and read about us. You don't need to, I don't need to waste the time with that. So let's go on to the what. What is a home inspector? A home inspector is actually a storyteller. We read the history of the house, we read the story of the house, and we tell that story to our client so that they know exactly what the house is before they buy it. According to the American Society of Home Inspectors, a home inspection is an objective visual examination of the physical structure and systems of a house from the roof to the foundation. The key word there is visual. We can only see what is visible to the eye. So if there is something behind a wall or something very skillfully hidden, and boy, we all know about those, we're not going to find it. It is not invasive. We can't punch holes in walls. We're not Mike Holmes. I don't know if any of you have seen his show, but boy, he just goes through walls and says, oh, the home inspector should have found that three feet behind the drywall and the board and the fancy sideboard. The home inspector should have found that. We can't do that. Uh, it's not technically exhaustive. We're not specialists. We are generalists. We know some about an awful lot of things. And we're good at reading the clues and tying those clues together to make that whole picture of the house. It's not a warranty, a guarantee, or insurance policy. S systems and structures in houses do fail spontaneously. Um, a roof that, leaks, that didn't leak today could leak tomorrow. We can't see the future. We have no way of knowing. What we like to say is that a home inspection is a snapshot in time. It's not a substitute for property disclosures. And it's not an appraisal. We have absolutely no interest in the value of the house. So we're not going to tell people, oh my god, you are overpaying for this house, or oh my gosh, this house is a real bargain. We have no interest in that. So let's talk about when you may need home inspections. For existing home sales, these are the ones that we're all familiar with. So for the buyer, they've written the contract on the house, and they are now getting ready to, uh, you know, they're in their due diligence period, so they want to find out the condition of the house, so maybe they can go and renegotiate the, the terms, all that. We're all familiar with that. We also do recommend pre-listing inspections. This is for people who are thinking or planning on selling their home, and they would really like to know the condition of the house so that they can fix things that a home inspector would otherwise flag. You really, really don't want to have to pay the professional plumber to come in and pull the toilet, reseat it, put the new wax ring in, and reseat the toilet, and charge you plumber's rates of about $300 when you can have a handyman do the exact same thing for 50 and then it never shows up on the home inspection report because it's already been repaired. So there's nothing to report there. So it makes your buyer's home inspection shorter and sweeter. New construction, there's a lot more of that going on around. We always recommend getting three inspections in new construction. The first is at pre-drywall. This is when all of the systems are in place, all the pipes, all the wires, the furnace, the ductwork, the electric, everything is in place except for the drywall. This is the last chance to see what's going on behind the walls before they close it all in. And we all know that drywall covers a multitude of sins. Then at the final walkthrough, we do something, is that focused? Yeah. Okay. We do something um, a little bit more unusual than uh, other home inspectors. We do what's called a fit and finish walkthrough before we do the final home inspection is we'll go through the entire house with a roll of red tape and a roll of green tape and we will flag minor and major cosmetic issues. Nail pops, scratches, dings, really sloppy paint jobs. So sometimes when we get through with a new house it looks like it has chicken pox. So uh, that's one of the things we do for the final walkthrough. Then we go through and do the whole final home inspection which is just the, the same inspection that we do for um, 
pre-sales. Yes, Jeremy. Yeah, I have a client right now that's buying over in Monocacy Crossing. He's one of all the properties that are over there. Now, he did the pre-drywall inspection. But you're saying you'll go in 90 days after their vertical, everything's done, punch out this is done, and you'll do the final walkthrough as part of your initial report, or is that a separate? It's a separate, separate, separate inspection. Okay. Because some, some builders, um, the, the pre-drywall, the final walkthrough, and the, the 11-month, they're all separate inspections. So, but if someone does a pre-drywall, we do give them a discount on the final walkthrough, but they are billed as separate inspections. It's not one wrapped in, because there are some people that choose to do one or the other. They say, well, which one's more important? Well, they're both important, because they're both there to catch different things. So we have to keep that open. Yeah. Oh, so we have, we... They, they, they catch different things. So the pre-drywall will catch the structural problems, but then the appliances aren't in place. So the final walkthrough will also do the appliances. Um, so it's a matter of they both have, they both are important. So. Okay. Another question. Yes. We have to. We have to get the builder's permission to enter the property because it does not yet belong to our client. Right. So what we do, is, you know, some builders are more cooperative mm -hmm. than others. Um, <laughs> um, but we generally send our builder uh, our insurance and licensing information in advance of the inspection so they know. And at pre-drywalls, we wear hard hats. Uh, we observe all the safety rules. There are some builders that don't allow walking on the roof. There are some builders now that are not allowing us to open up the electrical panel. Um, and we have to, yes, I know. And we have to abide by those rules. So, but yes, we will, we will work with the builder. Um, and with, we want to get the best possible outcome for our client. And sometimes we do tell the client, if your builder doesn't want an inspector there, you got to wonder why. You know, it kind of raises its own red flag. On, on the other side, there's Yeah, there, there's, there's some builders that do like us and welcome us, and there are some builders that go, oh, God, it's them. Um, so, yes? Uh, so the pre-drywall is, is, you know, understand the timing on that. Is, and I guess insulation is already going to be in place. We actually like to see it before the insulation is in place. There, but there's pros and cons either way. If we see it before the insulation is in place, we can see the pipes, the wires, et cetera. But if we see it after the insulation is in place, we can see where they really messed up the insulation. So there are pros and cons both ways. When they're being inspected by the trades inspectors, are they being inspected before and after insulation? They, yes, they, they have their own inspectors that do come through. But the, the county inspector, for example, has maybe 10 minutes. Yeah, no, and, I'm just yeah. quali qualifying that there's somebody that comes and looks at it after the insulation is in place. Uh, from the county, from the, yes, from yes yeah, 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 from the municipality, but again, going. yeah. So the next question, final walkthrough, how far in front of the settlement is that intended to be? Um, basically, everything has, the house has to be move-in ready. So they're probably still having a cleaning crew in place, but all of the systems are up and running, all of the appliances are installed and functional, all of the fixtures are in place, everything should be ready. It's usually done a day or two before closing. So that it's, it, depending on how tight the time frame is, uh, but we've gone in through for final walkthroughs and it's like, this house is not ready. So then we have to call and reschedule. One final question at the moment. The, um, you mentioned that there are some builders that won't let you in electrical panels and I'm sure that the list would be varied and wide. Mm -hmm. If you talk to every builder, there might be one thing they wouldn't want and another thing mm -hmm. another one wouldn't want. Is there a spec sheet that you have that says, here's what we're intending to do that a buyer can put into their contract that says, Here's what our inspector intends to do. Well, what they can do is they can go to the uh, Maryland Department of uh, Labor, <laughs> Licensing, and Regulation and download a copy of the Maryland Standard of Practice. Uh, that is actually one that the ASHI helped write. Uh, and that is the minimum standard of practice for a home inspection. Okay. Now, if we, for example, are forbidden from going into the electrical panel, we state that in our report that we did not open the electrical panel 
because the builder would not grant us permission, so we have to what's called disclaim the electrical panel. So we have no idea what's going on behind it. So, but they could, they could include a copy of the SOP in their contract saying, this is what my, my inspector is going to do. Yes. Okay? Yes. The 11-month walkthrough, this is when uh, you know, the, the, at, at one year the builder is going to come do the minor, minor fixes for the usual settling that happens at one year, maybe do the fixing the grading and all of that. We all recommend doing one more inspection, and we'll also go through and point out to the homeowner how to point out nail pops. We say have a flashlight in one hand and a glass of wine in the other, and hold your flashlight that way against the wall, and you'll see all the shadows and pops. So take a sip of wine, mark them all with tape, and then that's what. But the builder is only going to repaint with the builder color. So if you have custom painted, you are not going to want them to do the painting, either that or wait until one year to do all your custom paint jobs. Now there's also the home checkup. Houses age just like people do, and we all get our checkups with the doctor, so we're doctors that make house calls. We kind of have to. Uh, so we recommend every seven to 10 years getting a home checkup, because when you're in your house, you don't necessarily see it aging. We also recommend it for estate planning. Uh, if you want to know your house is usually your largest asset in your estate, you want to know its condition so you know um, how to address the needs that it's going to have when it ages along with you so that you know that you have adequate finances to properly maintain the home over the years. Now there's also a state disposition. Say you've inherited the family home, you have not lived there for 30 mm -hmm. years, you have no clue what the condition is, no clue what maintenance is required, no clue where the shutoff valves are. It's a good idea to get a home inspection then so you also can properly figure out what it needs in order to get it in habitable condition either to sell or to move into. Then there's divorce. Uh, this is another case where it's going to be beneficial to both sides to have a home inspection because that way you know the condition of the home, you know what work it needs, so if one party is going to buy out the other party, you know exactly what kind of monetary uh, fix-ups you're looking at so that the settlement is equitable. There's also uh, usually one person in a household or the other does certain duties like, oh, the wife always changes the furnace filter and the husband knows where all the shutoff valves are. So this is the time when everyone gets the same information so everyone knows how this house works so that they can, the party that stays behind can properly maintain it. Okay, so where does a home inspector go? Um, quite literally, we go from the top of the roof to the bottom of the foundation. Uh, this was a house that actually had three crawl spaces. I think it took uh, Bob about, what, two and a half hours just to do the crawl spaces. That was an interesting house. That had uh, a lot of interesting problems. So we start with the roof. Now, you as realtors and other property people, you can actually do what we call a first pass inspection before your buyer even contacts a home inspector before they even put an offer on the property. You can look at the house and see whether or not, because you know what your client's risk tolerance is, you can see whether or not this is something that you want, uh, that, that your buyer would be comfortable purchasing. So you start with the roof, and that is one of the big ticket things that can need fixing. Yes? Do you actually dress them off the roof? If we can, if it's safe. There are some roofs we can't. This roof, we would not walk, number one, it's too steep. Number two, it's too covered with moss. It's dangerous. Uh, there are certain roof materials we can't walk, like uh, slate, tile, metal roofs. Um, we only carry a 17-foot ladder. So if, like for townhouses, most townhouses, we can't get up on the roof. That's our insurance limitation. So for those, we, um, we use our binoculars, and we try to get uh, as far away as we can to get a good look at the entire roof. Um, we are also investigating the possibility of using drone technology to do roof inspections so that we can get pictures from above the roof vantage point while our feet are safely on the ground because every year about 300 people are killed and 64,000 are injured from ladder injuries. I don't want to be a statistic. I'd like to go home at night and if I cannot safely get on the roof, I'm not going to. So you start with the roof. You're looking whether or not it's got moss. Generally, when a roof has moss, that's it. It's at the end of its life. Uh, you're looking for the condition of the shingles, for the curling. You're looking for mushy spots, missing shingles. The rule of thumb is if 25% of the roof needs repair, the whole roof should be replaced. 
So now here we have the other issue you know about. Yes, Felix. As homeowners, what, we should, I mean, what should we be looking at when we look at the roof? Well, I actually, there is a brochure on our website that you can download uh, called Signs of uh, Roof Signs. Okay. So you can actually has pictures. You need to be looking for curling and cupping, a uh, lot of granules in the gutter because the granules are the UV coating. They're the sunscreen for your roof. And if they start washing off copiously, your roof's done. Uh, so there's a lot of signs that you can look for. Um, and there's, like I said, there's a brochure on our website you can download. Uh, got a lot of, oh my goodness. Um, water. Uh, this was a house we went into where the owner said, oh yeah, the sump pump just failed, but I've never had water problems. But if you look at that line, um, I think they've had water problems. So you're looking for obvious signs of water, leaks, stains, looking, even though the basement may look dry, if there's a lot of water stains on the bottom of the cardboard boxes and rust on the furnace and support columns, they've had water problems. And you're looking at electricity. One of, your, one of your best tools is this little circuit tester. And you might win one of these because we have a contest at the end. Um, checking, just going and checking the outlets. Uh, your, this is something like a fuse box even though it still works, is considered obsolete. Probably only has 65 amp service, which is way too small a service for today's modern life. You can look for the danger panels. And again, we have a brochure on our website about uh, hazardous panels, the Federal Pacific, Zinsco, Bulldog, Pushmatic. If you see one of those, you know you're looking at a panel replacement. There's also aluminum wiring, but you're not going to be able to see that without removing the dead front panel. Um, and of course, you're looking for the GFCIs. Now, plumbing. Flex pipe is usually a temporary solution that's left in there permanently. And with a ba basin under there, I think you think they know that they've got some leaking problems. Again, you're looking for low flow and you know, all of that kind of thing. Um, heating and cooling, that's another big ticket item. If you have to replace it, we call this frosty the heat pump. Usually, if you see this coat of ice, it means that the refrigerant level is low and it needs recharging. You're also checking to see if the rooms are an even temperature. So if you walk through the house and you get a warm spot or cold spot, the system needs servicing and balancing. Pull the filter, see what that looks like. The service life on a um, furnace, on a heat pump, is usually around 15, 17 years. That's a big ticket item to replace. That can be like $6,000 just for the cheapest builder grade heat pump system. Furnaces and boilers are a little less, but then you've got your separate air conditioning system to consider. Windows and doors. You're looking for gaps around windows and doors. Now, and we all see the basement bedroom with the non-egress window. So every bedroom needs two methods of egress, and you can't walk past an ignition source to get to one of the egresses. So if you have a bedroom where you have to walk past a furnace or a kitchen, that's not considered safe egress. Also looking for things like dual key deadbolts, fogged windows, cracked panes, stuff like that. So there's the big ticket items that you can immediately say. Roof replacement, depending on materials, can go from about six grand for a townhouse standard three tab shingle to over $150,000, $200,000 for a large house and a slate roof. Those are the really expensive ones. Polybutylene plumbing, we're still seeing this which is amazing. Now, there are companies that specialize in the replacement of poly, usually runs around $10,000 because it all has to be pulled and replaced, but they do a really nice job of it. Aluminum wiring. There are a few approved methods for remedying aluminum wiring. They're all expensive. Figure on $60 per junction. That means a room with a light switch, a fixture, and three plugs or four plugs. That's six junctions. That's $360 to fix that one room. And that does not address the issue of the fact that aluminum wires are fragile and they're more prone to, prone to breakage. Again, we talked about old HVAC. Um, deck replacement. Do you know that decks have a lifespan? The lifespan of a deck is only about 15 years. It's exposed to a lot of elements. And if it's not built properly with the right flashing and protection, it's going to last less than that. Um, underground oil tanks, these are a bureaucratic nightmare to get removed. So anytime you have an underground oil tank that the owner says, well, it was abandoned in place, it should have paperwork. So make sure that they have the paperwork. Otherwise, you're looking at thousands of dollars. Foundation repair, they can be simple. They can be as, as low as maybe $1,000 for an epoxy on a single crack, or you could be looking at tens of thousands of dollars for helical piers, excavation, major repairs. 
Wood destroying organisms. Uh, we are not pest control experts and we are not M word experts. We technically can't even use the word mold, uh, but in closed company, I can use it. Um, that can run into the thousands of dollars, absolutely thousands of dollars. And sometimes you can't get financing if there is documented mold in the house. If you use the M word, oh my God, the bank is going to go crazy. Um, septic and well issues. Replacing a septic system is really expensive if you can. If the property doesn't perk for a new system, you may have to get what's called a holding tank system, which means you have to get it pumped every month. And that's like 200 bucks a pump. So, and in Montgomery County at least, if the property has a septic field, but is now serviced by a, is now accessible to the municipal sewer system, if your field fails, you will not be permitted to repair or replace the field. You must tie in to the municipal system at your expense. Now, we price that on our property because we're on a septic system, but we've got the pipes that now run past the house. We got a conservative estimate of $90,000 to hook into the municipal system. Don't you know we baby our septic tank? So now we're getting into some of the hazardous stuff. Asbestos contain, appears to be asbestos containing materials. Again, I'm not an expert. It used to be easy to test for asbestos. You break off a piece, you put it in a bag, you send it to a lab. Can't do that anymore, unfortunately. Now the issue with asbestos is if it's what's called friable, if it's going to release particles in the air. You have um, the possibility of finding, anyone see these nine by nine tiles? If you see nine, nine inch by nine inch tiles, that's pretty much guaranteed that they will contain asbestos. It used to be after, um, asbestos, after they stopped putting asbestos in tiles, they started manufacturing nine by nine vinyl tiles. And the government said, no, 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 no. You will not make them nine by nine. You will make them a different size so that they can be easily distinguished from the asbestos containing tiles. So if you see nine by nine, it's probably asbestos. It's not an issue. This is totally encapsulated. These fibers, unless you are going to run one of those waxers and buffers over this every single day, it's not going to release any fibers into the air. You can put a layer of linoleum over it and you're done. You don't have to worry about it ever again. Yes, Peggy? What if, it's what if there are like a lot of cracked ones? If they're cracked ones, you, know, you can seal the edges. Right. Yeah, basically you know, run a layer of polyurethane mm -hmm. over it and seal it down so that it doesn't crack or fray anymore. Fill it in with a leveling compound and put in, put in another floor over it. So that it's covered up. It's totally encapsulated. It's safe. Um, any house built before 1978 is presumed to have lead paint. Again, you have to have the contractor doing the work has to test it. We just use um, lead swabs. Um, wood destroying organisms, like I said, you know, this was a basement of an 1890 farmhouse. That was awful. Um, yeah, it's another, you just don't want to see that. This was a basement that I had to wear a respirator in. Um, and sometimes the signs are not obvious. I mean, this just looks like a cracked jam of a window, but I happened to be there during the termite inspection, and um, that was the windowsill. They had swarmed the night before. So this was in a $2.2 million house in Potomac, and the termite tubes were on the opposite side of the house. The entire basement was riddled and would have to be, uh, would have to be taken out. Who knows what this is? Hummingbird feeder. Nope. <laughs> It's called a fire grenade. If you see these, the important thing, don't touch them. They contain carbon tetrachloride. That is a carcinogen. When it is heated, it forms phosgene gas, which was used as a chemical weapon in World War I. Nasty stuff. You see one, you call the fire department. What would happen is these were put over furnaces. So if the, there was a fire near the furnace, a metallic, a, a metallic switch would melt flip open like a, uh, a mousetrap like thing, break the glass and spew carbon tet over the fire to smother it and kill the oxygen. Um, you know, kill the occupants is not a really good byproduct, but unfortunately that's one of the things that it could do. Don't touch them. Radon, you know that where the central Maryland is in a hot zone for radon. This is the EPA's own map. Uh, the actionable level for picocuries per liter, but the EPA is looking into lowering that to 2.7 to be in line with Canada and European nations. I know. Okay, so this is the fun part. Why get a home inspection? We're going to have a little contest here. Spot the defect. 
Anybody know here? Yep, the column under that. You win a circuit tester. So that allows water to get into the electrical panel. So that can cause, you know, water and electricity don't play well together. It also exposes the feed wires to the sharp edges of the panel. We actually drove past a house where this caused a fire, and we spotted it. Bob spotted it just as the spark went off and was able to call the fire department, get the family out, and save, save the house. They were pretty grateful. Can you spot the defect here? Got to make it real quick. Now, gas can. Should never, never store a gas can inside. This was a crawl space. What's the problem here? What's the address? Yeah. No ma How's the fire department going to find you? You have to have a house number. We, we, you know, big. Big is really good. And not the fancy 1,946 over the garage. Oh, my gosh. Use numbers and use nice big numbers. What's the problem here? Yeah, but specifically, it's side bolted. These beams are being held up by two bolts. Bolts have no shear strength. By shear strength, it means they have very little strength up and down. They're meant to hold things together. So this entire weight is being held on two, two bolts that aren't designed to hold that weight. Very dangerous. Any problem here? I'll give it to you. It's a trick question. This is actually what we like to see. We've got flashing. We've got staggered bolts. We've got the proper joist hangers. Everything looks really good. We see that maybe one time out of 50. Problem here? Thank you. You got that, Peggy. You got that. Absolutely. How are you supposed to get into the, uh, the garage there? Okay. <laughs> who said who said access? Who said Yes, you got it, Joan. You can't access the panel. This is one of those dead giveaways that the um, the basement was finished without a permit. <laughs> also, you know, you look at the Fios box, it was just sort of perched here on the edge instead of being mounted. So, that was dangerous. Thank you. You win the prize. This is actually in a common area of a condo association, of a condo building. Now, that may not be what we technically have to inspect, but we are looking at the common areas because that affects the safety of the occupants in the building. Well, well it is, the, the thing is, it's by a walking surface. For years, these have required to have guards when they are uh, uh, below seven feet over a walking surface. I just call a deck a walking surface. These are hot, so that's a, a failure there. Yeah. Exactly. You got it. This is that what happens when you have the trades get into an argument. When the uh, dryer vent had been put in by the duct guy, but the electrician's order said put a light there, so he just cut the duct. This is why you get pre drywalls. Yeah. You're looking up at a garage door opener? What are those things? I have no idea. Those are the photoelectric eyes that are supposed to be at the bottom of the garage door. Oh <laughs> really effective. Oh really effective. Okay, I'm going to whip through a couple of pictures really quick. This, these are from our Hall of Shame. Water does not run uphill. Uh, this was the, the stool says attic stool, do not move because the attic stairs were too short, so they used that to extend the attic stairs. ABS to PVC, there is no glue approved to glue the two together. If you ever see a glued joint between those pipes, it's wrong. It's supposed to be a mechanical joint. How do you turn the water off on that toilet? Like I said. <laughs> I think they need to clean their dryer duct. I actually don't think you're allowed to put screening over your dryer ducts anymore for that very reason. Yeah, they built the deck after they put in the uh, high efficiency. That's going to eat that deck up. Yeah, watch that first step, or you'll end up in the window well. 
added a second floor, didn't extend the chimney, the shower for dwarves. Another clue that they finished the basement without permits. Usually there's an outlet behind or you're below the, uh, the panel. They just didn't feel like extending it. I think they had a gas fire. The scary thing is the inspector who had done the house two weeks prior to us never reported on that uh, charring of the attic, of the uh, basement framing. Bats. Bats. This is an, actually, this is a health hazard because if there are bats up there, mm -hmm. most likely all of the insulation needs to be removed from that attic because it can be contaminated. So you're actually looking not at just eradicating the bats, but a lot of environmental. Almost done. See this way too often. Putting the screw right through the label that says drive nail through hole in metal bracket. Again, drywall screws have no shear strength. So that is a, that is a safety hazard. 170 is just a touch too hot for water. Should be 120. Yeah, this was a bedroom. This was a master bedroom where they used to keep chickens. And actually, in the room below it, there was a hole in the wall where they had to knock out because one of the chickens fell through a gap. And they had to knock the, uh, the piece of the wall out to rescue the chicken. We call this our Jenga pier. This was below a kitchen. It's resting on one brick. Dryer vent exhausting inside. You know, that's tinder. That's really nice and flammable. It's why we go into the crawl spaces. Um, I love to see hose bibs as faucet heads. Yeah, yeah, it's a shower head. And my favorite is you never know what you're going to find in a garden shed when you're inspecting. That happens to be an Emmy Award. I looked it up. It's real. Uh, so that was just one of those. It, it was, it was a, a CNN producer, um, and I was doing a, a pre-listing inspection. Uh, no, I was doing a, a, a pre-offer inspection on the house. So that was just a shock in the garden shed. So that's it. Thank you all very much for coming. And anyone who didn't get a tape measure, please take a tape measure. Um, I've also got a couple of books here and a couple more circuit testers. So by all means, thank you so much for your attention. Inspectionsbybob.com is the website. So look forward to talking to you.